Guys, welcome back. The fourth installment for 2023 of the Turkey OG series here on DeerCast. Uh, my co-host, Mark Drury. Again, it's crazy even saying that. And 12-year-old Kurt and also 32-year-old Kurt is freaking out right now because I have two of my childhood heroes on the same call on the same podcast. So Mark Drury, Michael Waddell, uh, I don't even know what I'm doing here. It's kind of hard to believe, <laughs> honestly. It's just uh, this is a cool moment for me, just so you guys know. As we get into this, it's cool for us, Kurt, because you're one of our heroes, buddy. I mean, you you are you are the best out there in the podcast world, and we're we're happy to be here with you today. And I'm so happy Michael joined us. And Michael, we've been doing this series about OGs, and when Kurt when Kurt first told me about OG, like we were on a podcast, and he mentioned it, and I I didn't know what he meant. And when we got off the podcast, I said, "What what the hell's an OG?" And he goes, <laughs> Those original gangster. I said, oh, God. And then we started talking. He said, man, we ought to do a series about turkey hunting OGs. All right. So I'm going to start this podcast out with a question for you. Name some OGs in your life from a turkey perspective. We've had several with this series, but a lot of these guys were like people that were instrumental to me as I was coming along. Like, give us your top six, seven, eight people that are OGs in your mind from a turkey perspective. Oh, goodness. That, that's an exciting question because, you know, obviously I love turkey hunting and um, <clears throat> no doubt. I mean, it's what got me into the industry. And and I know, you know, first time I met you was at a turkey collar contest. Yeah, I think that's at the world championship. And um, yeah, e man, that's easy. So, so man, uh, obviously a lot of those OGs are not with us anymore. They, they turkey hunting in heaven right now, chasing gobblers, you know, people like, uh, you know, Dick Kirby yep. and, uh, uh, you know, some that's not with us like Billy McCoy. Holy cow. Um, but a lot of the, the living legends, in my opinion, right now, OG, I mean, obviously, uh, Paul Butsky. Yep. I mean, golly, Paul Butsky, the Walter Parrots of the world. And then and another somebody has gone, Ben Lee Rogers, uh, amazing inspiration to me. Uh, even the Rom brothers, like Dale Rom, obviously, Dale, Dale's still around. Man, I, that dude is like Keith Richards. You can't keep him down. He, yeah. uh, Mr. Dale Rom's still kicking around. But, um, Man, it goes on. Walter Parrott. Uh, I mean, I think of people like Denny Gulvis. Yes. I think, oh, God, like I saw Skeet Thomas at the NWTF. I mean, just an unbelievable turkey caller. Um, Joe Drake. Yep. It, even it, it was crazy. And, and um, even though we're close in age, you know, I, I remember just being completely intimidated showing up at a turkey calling contest and people like Matt Moret would be there. You would be there. Um, obviously, Walter Parrott, you know, even Chris Parrish. I mean, I, I'm a student of this turkey game, but um, th there's a lot of people, too, that I looked at. They were just straight up turkey, great turkey ambassadors, you know, that not only develop good calls like, you know, Will Primos, Cus Strickland. They're definitely in that to me. Yes. Um, I mean, I literally could probably talk the whole hour podcast just doing nothing but naming people that was insp insp inspirational to me that I consider OG. But these guys are not only a original but they were gangsters man these guys invented <laughs> tactics and tips and calls and technique i mean and they really so helped pave, championships you they know helped pave the way for what we do now with you know the media that you do and the media that Drury outdoors does and you mentioned some of the guys we've had on the podcast already and the, the guests have been so awesome to talk to we asked denny to be on but denny's not doing podcasts right now his response was awesome he was like well actually i'm very focused on morning roost talk right now you know he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm out there recording every day you know but i'm gonna get him on here before it's over with because he's he's one of my all-time heroes and we had we had harold on which I, I know you would agree with that. Harold Knight, absolutely. David Hale, good night. David Hale. Uh, we, had, we had Toxie on. He was so fun to talk to. We had Ernie Calandrelli on. Yes. Yeah. So, it, and Butsky, of course, was on. And we had Steve Stoltz on, too, you know. Stoltz? Yeah. You know, because I know one of the reasons I wanted Stevie on, because I don't know that he gets the credit that he sometimes deserves because Steve like he was one of my heroes when I first started call like he was one of the first guys that ever took the time to come over I was just a young kid and he complimented how I'd called that day well that was in the that was in the mid 80s and he'd been calling since the 70s well look how relevant he's remained from the 70s 80s 90s you know aughts yeah. to, to 20s like he's still he was in the top you know, 15 this past weekend or top 12 at the NWTF. So he's still out there performing. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody else that spanned that much time and be that relevant for that many years other than I, Steve. I want to give him a shout out too, Mark, because 
after we did that show with Steve at the Iowa Classic, came up, high five me, brought me a beer, came to our booth, bought a T-shirt. I, I tried to give him one. He bought a T-shirt, tags me and everything on Instagram. Like the guy has just been so awesome. So that was pretty cool. After we did that yeah. podcast, I just kept in contact with them, you know. Absolutely. That, well, what Mark's talking about too, people like Steve, you know, another name I thought just thought of is, you know, Eddie Salter. But when you Eddie, think about Eddie right Salter and the Steve Stoltz and overall all these guys, when you think about uh, not only were they great turkey ambassadors and just heroes that taught us so much that, that were very intimidating, obviously, if you show up, showed up to call and you was hoping to get your money back for entry fee and maybe gas money and what that red roof end would have cost. You kind of already thought, well, I, I'm not, you know, Salter's still calling. Even Preston Pittman is still yelping. I remember I thought he had retired and I got into it and I showed up at a Grand America and there Preston Pittman is like, dude, I thought you were retired, you know. <laughs> and so uh, you're looking back, but but man, you talking about brought a tear to my eye. You know, you're talking about these these guys at the NWTF. My wife was at the show and we were kind of tied down at the bone collector booth and um, she sent me a picture and it was Eddie Salter kneeled down with a slate call with my little old six-year-old boy and he was hugging the back of him and he was you know rubbing rubbing uh rubbing on that dang slate call trying to make sounds and dude i literally got teared up and so eddie salter did exactly the same thing with me when i was 12 years old he and here it is at the time he didn't even know it was my boy and uh just true character men just amazing not only the great turkey callers but they've given so much back to humanity and how they act and how they treat you know uh, those guys are just amazing I, I got box calls here behind me that uh that dick kirby made for me just when i was a caller like he'd give them to me you know he's selling these calls for several hundred dollars and he would just might draw this artwork on it and say man i just really like what you're doing um so it, it's a crazy i don't i don't know if people realize the history that Somebody like myself, Mark. We were lucky to live it. We, we were lucky it. to live it and have them as uh, examples. We talked about that last year. Michael and I had a conversation. We were shooting the breeze on the phone one day, and we talked about, man, look at the examples we had to guide us down the paths that we eventually took. We were very fortunate in that regard, and um, we're just so blessed. And, and you're in that same conversation. That's that's why we wanted you on the show. Go ahead, Kurt. Do you have a point there? Yeah, because when you you guys saying that, it's like hearing all these stories, the OG stories, and hearing you talk, Michael. I look at that as like, man, I wish I could have experienced that. But I was born in '90, so a lot of this is <laughs> going on, you know, like before I was even born or even thought about. Do you think that maybe that like OG heavy impactful era era of turkeys or just hunting in general is that like something that's kind of died after that generation of OGs came through and influenced and brought modern hunting and industry what it is today is is it a thing of the past is it just a new version I, I think I think it's a little harder but I don't think it's died I mean there is a hell of a lot of responsibility you know Kurt on 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 y'all shoulders and you know like mark started off and i always brag on you guys all you guys at working class you guys will be looked at as the og of podcasts and communication and, and what y'all do at another level so everything evolves and and for me i look back at what those guys did from all the way back to the neil cost to like denny gulvis to you know obviously it, it does date and kind of age some of these guys but they were pioneers but at the time they also were getting probably ridiculed by, you know, those old, older and possibly newer turkey hunters that were saying, oh, I can't believe they would come out with a, a four reed cutter. And I, you know, I can't believe that they would now have this type of tactic. I can't believe they would have this extended choke tube that you could kill turkeys further or whatever. So in reality, I think the cool thing about being original and grassroots is the fact that we forget to see that it evolved. So I do think, yes, the younger generation will be sitting just like no different than Mr. Dale Rom when he started mass producing turkey calls. There's going to be a lot of people look back in history and they're going to be able to love those people, but they will also come with a, with a price. So anytime you're talking about original gangster, or you're talking about an original grassroots or innovator, there's a lot of hate that comes with it as well. You know, just like Elvis Presley gets labeled the king of rock and roll, but he was loved. But they also had every Sunday churches praying uh, because he was going to be the end of humanity and he was, you know, singing the devil's music. So I think that's what happens, you know, when when somebody like Harold and David come out with a pretty boy decoy that 
kind of revolutionized how you could set up on a turkey or somebody that come out with the first ground blind that you could truly hide and a turkey just can't see in that sucker you sit out in the hay field I mean Mark and I were kids we didn't have that opportunity to do that with our kids you was either you know had your shoulders squared up to a big old tree or pine tree to hide with some good camouflage and now people can go about it different um but somebody innovated that so I, I think yes Kurt the answer is yes uh, the only thing that, that people can be able to, to to inflict history and become just like those names were mentioning that Mark and I truly admired and looked up to. I do think we have to be careful that we keep the campfires warm. I think the biggest thing those guys did, I look back on them and I remember all the time getting my butt kicked because I learned a turkey hunt in Georgia. And, and I think it's some of the aggravatingest turkeys to hunt and trick. And I remember just thinking, God, what would Paul Butsky do? Man, I wish I had Billy McCoy here. I mean, I, God, I'd do anything. I wish Eddie Salter would come to me. I know he's over in Evergreen, Alabama. I bet he would have got this turkey, you know. And I remember just wishing I could just parachute Dick Kirby in to help me out, you know. And uh, But they had learned things and developed things that had made it easier. Um, but the biggest thing I think they did for me, they had such a warm campfire around people. And they made it fun and they loved on you and they made you feel special, even though, you know, you knew deep down you couldn't call like them. They certainly made me feel like I was going to win a world championship. And inevitably, you know, I teamed with Ricky Joe and I did. You know, inevitably I had a chance to 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 compete against them. I had a chance to hunt with a lot of them. And so uh, I think that's the most important thing that if, if there's any young people that want to be inspirational, remember to love and remember to to keep a campfire warm. And we do have to be careful in our hunting industry because it's getting a little bit more financially driven. And, uh, you know, if you want to use the word private equity, which I think there's some positives of that, but sometimes around these booths, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, you walk up and it's Eddie Salter that's just giving your kid a piece of candy like your granddaddy and saying, here's your Jolly Rancher. Let me show you how to run that box call. It's not Harold Knight like, you know, hey boy, come over here. I'm on. I got a little piece of pork chop left over and I'm going to show you how to yep on that four recall. You know, it's, it's not Dick Kirby, you know, saying some cool, you know, uh, something that was only some dialect from Orchard Park and, and he's just hugging on you and showing you how a, a really fine tuned, tuned up boat paddle is. And so, yes, I do think that's available, but you have to go back and study those guys and their path and what they did. And I'm going to tell you something first time I seen even Mark was on a Primos video and, and he was walking around. He looked to be in his twenties and uh, obviously he was a phenomenal Turkey caller, but guess who he was with? And Mark remember that he was a people like Ernie Calandretti. He, he was hanging out with these guys that were just in his opinion, OGs. And he was exactly right because I had the same opinion of them, but they are the ones that taught him how to do it. And those same guys and the people that, that I've been around, they taught me that respect. And I think that can get missing some of the respect gets missing and uh we can't always agree but uh i think the respect and the love is what those guys showed that literally almost get me emotional thinking about some of the things they said to me and inspired me to call i mean not to hog up the podcast but i talk a lot but i but you know i remember um dale rom sent me a box of calls kurt and i did not have the security i i was very bashful then you wouldn't know it now but i didn't want to talk i was scared i didn't want to call against walter parrot and he sent me down a box of calls and um and he said, I want you to use them in a contest. And so one day it's getting close to a contest. Well, I didn't know it. He'd come to Georgia. Well, guess who shows up at my door? It's Dale Rom. And he said, are you getting ready to call in the contest tonight? And I said, well, no, sir. I just, I ain't got the confidence. He said, well, I didn't see any of these calls not to, not to use. He said, and I wouldn't have sent them to you if I didn't think you had the ability to win. So he almost in a fatherly, you know, granddad way made me like no options, no excuses you know, I believe in you and you got to learn to believe in yourself. And he told me, he said, don't worry about getting a hunter division. He said, if you're going to get beat, let get beat by the best. And um, so those are the things that people in the inside scoop and the behind the scenes. And I know Mark's got a lot of those stories as well. It's it, we were just so blessed to have those guys in our lives. Like we talked about it, like every weekend was like a, a family reunion. You know, we'd go yep. somewhere in the country, whether it be down South or Northeast or Midwest and Maybe not everybody was there, but throughout the spring calling, you know, circuit, you'd see everybody before it was over with. And and Michael was talking about being able to pay your entry fee, being able to pay for the red roof, and the real bill was from the bar bill. 
<laughs> yes. We'd, do, we'd go find the local tavern and everybody get down and have a good time. And it, uh, we're just lucky we grew up like we did. We really are blessed. Hey, Mark, or, or, or even if there was any beer left at the local pub because Don Shipp and Larry Shockey was there. They drank it all. Yeah. <laughs> they drank it all. So, Michael, all right, diving into like turkey tactics, that type of stuff. I, I ask this question of every single guest like, what's something, a few things like that you have historically seen people maybe making mistakes when you're observing other people hunt or hear it on public ground or hear it on the same piece of dirt you're hunting, some mistakes you've seen people make. And then also, what are some things that you consistently have success with, a, a, a tactic or two where you're like, I'm, I'm, this is what I do the most to kill turkeys. So things you've learned and also mistakes you've seen people make. I, I think the answer to that, uh, you know, the way I'd explain it would probably answer both of those, Mark. Um, the, the biggest thing, the way I've always looked at turkey hunting, and it didn't click to me until I killed a few turkeys and I had a chance to hunt with some people that we're talking about, you know, uh, early in this podcast, those names, is I, I think early I was looking at things as a very solution-based uh, conclusion to get results, meaning I, I, would, I knew the rule of thumb of turkey hunting. Like, we can go through it. You hear it on podcasts, you know, a turkey – likes to come uphill they don't necessarily like to come downhill we know they don't like to cross structures and fences and creeks we know those things we know that you shouldn't call too loud you know we know that you shouldn't in some situations call too much uh, we know that turkeys can see we know they can pinpoint where they're hearing exactly where that you know noise come from but what i miss in those early years that i feel like i adapt now is no different than coming on this podcast and communication and, and how you can feel the love, you know, as, as when, when people know and hear about, you know, Mark, Drury and I's relationship, or we talk just in our language and our, our reactions. If you had a, a body language expert, they know that like, dude, Mark and Mark and Terry Waddell really respect each other. But you also can look into a situation. It's like if you're uncomfortable or somebody's talking crap or somebody's yelling or they're intoxicated, you immediately know their body language and their tone or their voice that they're not themselves. Um, you know, I've been through some really tough times in my life and uh, immediately in conversations, you didn't know it, but you immediately I could tell there was a different love and concern. Like, I hope you're doing good, Waddell, you know, and, and vice versa. We've all been through, you know, tough tragedies and some self-inflicted, you know, some, some obviously, you know, death and families or maybe businesses, a lot of things. And so we understand each other through our communication. And, and when I realized that once you leave this house and you put on your choice of camouflage, you really just become a turkey. And so you take that rule book, you take that one-on-one, that grassroots lessons that we all know that we should apply but you forget about that. And that's when a yelp don't become a yelp. It, it's no different than me saying, hey, or hey, or hey. There's 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 so many differences just to a saying hello. Um, there's a lot of differences. And and your wife, you know, saying, you know, how you doing, honey? Or how you doing, honey? Or how you doing? You know immediately if you have forgot to take out the trash or there's the mystery of the unknown that you didn't know anything that you missed, but you know you did by a simple gesture that says the same thing. So a yelp, a cluck, cutting, all this means different things. The way you go through the woods, your cadence to walk through the woods, all of it can apply and be made different. Your visual aspect, are you trying to hide and be camouflaged? Are you trying to be seen to a degree, you know, uh, based on a tactic with a decoy or obviously getting in an area where you want to be in the sun or at least your decoys in the sun. So not only are you, uh, you know, through hearing, you, you're manipulating the situation, but through visual effects. So you become a redneck Copperfield. So when I thought to myself, I'm really this outsider. Maybe it's me and my buddy, Mark Drury. We get up, we look at a map that we don't know anything about this property. We've been told where the property line's on. Now we digitally have it and we can apply that. Um, and we know that we have no excuses to jump to Creek. <laughs> like in the old days, we know that we're not supposed to be across there. Uh, so there's no ignorance of that. And basically, it's just in our case, if I'm hunting with you, I'm thinking, OK, we're walking in here. We're no longer Mark Drew, no longer Michael Waddell. We are part of a flock or trying our best to engage into a flock to a social situation that is very high in the pecking order. No different than the relationship you have with your kids, your brothers, your aunts, your uncles, the people in your company. So imagine me outside this door walking into the jury's office at one time. Uh, you know, the, everybody knows me there. But in this situation, me and you are not known. Um, we, we have, they have no clue. This flock is completely 
uh, a, a stranger to us and, and our sounds are completely a stranger to them. And so when you start looking high level at that, mistakes people make is not even thinking that deep on it. And so once you can realize going into a situation and you're working a turkey that's maybe hand up, you can apply yourself to figuring out, hey, do I want to be kind of this nagging, really loose hen that's got fishnets on that literally is trying to be with every gobbler there? Or am I trying to be a girl's girl in my approach? Am I trying to fit in? Am I just trying to keep things at ease? So it is completely no different than going into a conference room and pitching a story, pitching an opportunity and to show what you think could be a solid situation. So in one way, some men, some people, some women can certainly be what you call a con artist and paint a picture that's not true. So in reality, if you're a turkey hunter, you are being a con artist. You are completely, a completely different personality. You become a turkey and you can become a gobbler. You can be a subordinate gobbler. You can be a dominant. You can be a hen. You can be a very subordinate hen. You can be a young hen, mature hen. And you can take that approach based on the situation. So you're feeding them what they're feeding you. Once you get at that level, bro, people can throw all these tactics out there they want to and what's good and what's bad. It ain't going to slow down. If you want to go ahead and put an original gangster label on somebody, if they got that, no state, no government, nobody on Instagram is going to take away a tactic that they won't be successful because they are master manipulators. They are complete con artists to coming into a situation with a flock of wild turkeys and fitting in, just like Denny Gulvis. Denny Gulvis might not be human. Uh, the only two people that I want to see some birth identification with is Elon Musk and, and Denny Gulvis because Denny is a turkey. He, he don't need a decoy. If Denny's got halfway some camouflage or earth tone colors to his get up and he can get a hickory leaf and put it in front of his face, that dude is just... He, he thinks like a turkey. He, he, he's, he, he just thinks like a turkey. And so uh, it's kind of like these comedians, you know, you, you know, these people are so sharp on their feet, feet. You cannot back them in a corner. You cannot embarrass them. You cannot cut them down because they can come back swinging. And that's what Denny can do in the turkey woods. That's what these guys can do. So, yeah, maybe give them a decoy. They can manipulate with it. Give them a call. They can manipulate with that. Give them a wing bone. They can do that. Give them nothing. They know enough about the lay of the land and where those turkeys want to feed and where they're going to go. They can just follow behind them like a Mohican Indian son and slip up and grab them by the feet. So tactics are important, but understanding the big picture is the most important because that is why successful turkey hunters are successful, not because of their tools, because of their life and what they know. So that's my high level answer to that. And I think it kind of answers both. And uh, that's when I think it really started clicking to me. And, you know, I don't care, you know, what, if I look out of regulation, say, oh, man, okay, Alabama this year, you can't use decoys the first week of the season. Call me cocky. It doesn't slow me down. It doesn't make me think I'm not going to kill a turkey. And especially if I got Mark with me because you're at the same level. You're at the same thought process. I'm looking back at you, and you're, you're, you're walking and maybe let out a sweet little yep right before you sat down the tree to walk four or five steps to a tree. We have got this illusion of whatever. And most of the time when you get to that level of understanding that turkey, me and you both have read this turkey either as very dominant by himself with hens, possibly subordinate. And, and so in that, you that's when it becomes magical and unstoppable. And the only thing that stops you is a limit or you just don't kill them. That's it. Or you decide not to pull the trigger. That That's 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 how I feel about it. That, that's a great answer. Fantastic answer. And, you, and you're spot on with it as well, Michael. Hopefully people at home can translate that and take it out into the woods this spring and kind of remember what Michael just said and try to become part of that flock. Try not to be the outsider. Try to make sure that you're fitting in and try to read the situation. So often I, I see people, they'll go in there and they'll wade right into a turkey and, you know, bump him off the roost or they're, they're just calling too loud or too much and, and you sit there and shake your head if you listen to what the turkeys do you can key in on and interpret exactly what mood they're in and what transition they're in harold talked a lot in our podcast with him about where are they at in the breeding what transition are they in what should we be doing in this period it's exactly what michael's talking about when you get to that point especially like after several years i always like i always think experience comes down to have I been in a situation like this before and what did I do that didn't work and what did I do that did work? And that will start to help you make decisions as you go forward. The more you hunt and the more you understand 
what your calling means to them and how you're affecting their mood. That's something I was going to throw in too. Like after hearing both of you guys say that, you know, um, I, I like thinking about hunting that there's layers to it, you know, like, you know, kind of McGregor, there's layers to this game. And I've always said that about deer hunting too, because I'm more experienced in deer hunting than I am turkey hunting. And I can feel as I get more into it, I'm understanding where the layers are and then like what the next layer is or what it might be and how to tap into it. Like the next, it's hard to really explain. It's like kind of high level and mythical in a way when you break it down, but it really is like, there's guys that you can tell the guys who don't understand the layers of the game and that their success shows it, or just they're kind of fighting through the layers. Then you see when guys start to understand the layers of it and their success becomes consistent and they think about hunting in different ways, if that makes sense. But it, do, it does make sense. It, it yeah. for me, Curtis makes very good sense because that same sensible thought process makes sense in anything in life and business and recreational sports, baseball, football, or in yeah. my case, I love playing the guitar. So that's a prime, you know, that's a perfect relation to, you know, say turkey hunting to me and say playing a guitar. Well, I'm a decent guitar player. Decent. I know the chords. I don't know a lot of music theory, but this guitar neck to me is not a piece of me. I have to think about it. Okay. Go to this pentatonic scale in E. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. I get to jam along sweet home Alabama. I know that's, D, C, and G. So I kind of know in my thought process of this pragmatic understanding or studying where Stevie Ray Vaughan never thought at the level of what I'm doing. I'm just like, ding, 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 ding. And he's just like, Ooh. he he don't even have to know that it's in D. He hears it and immediately just closes his eyes and got a Marlboro Red hanging out his lips and just shred. And so does Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen took this guitar play into a whole nother level of just bringing noises and sounds. So he's kind of one with his guitar. So that's kind of like I was when Mark was asking me about Turkey. I, I think that's it. That 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 is that higher level mythical deal. But keep in mind i do think sometimes we try to make these animals so much more superior which they are because we love them and they have a lot of instincts but you know i've got i've got turkeys and i've seen turkeys i've seen turkeys stand on the side of a fence and um i've seen turkeys stand on the side of a, a fence and uh hold on just a second so, all right we're I, back on <laughs> some technical sorry about that. difficulties it's all right dude but yeah <laughs> I, I was just saying it, it does become mythical like you're saying because when you get to that next level, you, you quit thinking. You're not thinking about, you know, EC or G or A. You're, you're just becoming one with the guitar. In the case of turkey hunting and these animals, you know, keep in mind, you you know, a deer is basically a wild goat. I don't want to minimize it, but in my mind, I think about things and I try to break it down to simple. They're not sitting here thinking about, you know, how ain't Sharon feels and who's sick and who's not and, what it's going to feel like when they go breed, you know, a certain doe or heck in their case, breed their sister. They, 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 they just wild animals. They mm -hmm. trying to find something under, you know, to, to get them a little clover, little acres. Oh, somebody put some corn out. Turkey's kind of the same way. They're like, man, I don't know. I got whooped yesterday, but I sure would like to meet a nice young hen. Cause I really just something in me wants to breed. I just want to jump on her back, knock some feathers up, man. I don't, oh, grasshopper, oh, grasshopper. And then they get to a fence and they don't know how the hell they even cross it. I've seen turkeys in a no more. I've seen turkeys in Iowa stand by a hog wire fence and look like, dude, I want on the other side. I don't know how the hell. They forgot that they flew a hundred foot up a freaking white oak tree the next yesterday and roosted. And they don't know how to get over a fence. So we try to make these animals, these Einstein, like they're, on roost coming up with a new bomb or, you know, some freaking new electric car, you know, they're not, they're thinking, man, I'd really like a grasshopper and I'd really like to screw something. That'd be great. And I really don't want to get whooped. And one of them is sitting on them like, dude, I'm, I am going to get everything. Every hen's mine. And I see one guy where I'm a freaking, I'm going to kill him. I'm not going to hurt him. I'm going to kill him. And, and I know how to get across the Creek. You know, I ain't gonna let no deadfall, you know, Stand in front of me, you know, I, I hear somebody yelping over there and last minute they found out it was freaking Mark Jury, uh, but they are confident. They're just wild and crazy. But at the end of the day, they're, they're walking around kind of goofy. They don't really know. So some people say, well, you know, certain ways, you know, this make turkeys look dumb. And I say, well, sometimes, you know, it is a turkey. You know, I mean, it, our great grandfather, you know, it was a long old cliche to say, man, dude, dumb as a turkey. 
I didn't come up with that. Somebody acknowledged that a turkey ain't the smartest thing, but these wild turkeys have instinctual measures. So reality, if you can break it down and understand that they don't have that social structure uh, of, of the peer pressure and Facebook and what goes on, they're just trying to breathe. They're trying to make it. They're trying to get to the next day and they're trying to do selfishly what they want to do. They have no concern of any other person out there. I mean, even these hens don't really have a lot of concern. They do when these they have an instinctual you know, nature to be a good mom when their turkeys are poults and to protect them. But once they get out on their own, they're back to like, hey, I'm going to breed and have some more youngins and I'm done with them. They ain't cool worried about getting Yeah. It's cool to think about because it's like on one end, it's like this methodical layers of the game conversation. And then how you said, simplify it and break it down. Cause a lot of stuff, yep. deer, turkeys, when you think about it, it's like, Oh, of course they did that. But it's, a, it's almost like a sweet spot to understand both sides of the game and then yes. apply it in real time, how you need to apply it. One yes. of the greatest traits you can have as a hunter is persistence. And sometimes it just comes down to going as hard as you can and as smart as you can, as long as you can, to catch a turkey in the right mood with the right weather or a deer in the right mood with the right weather. You're doing everything you can on good days and bad days, but sometimes it comes down to persistence and having the time to be out there and catch them in the right mood. Exactly what Michael's talking about, because they're just trying to live. They're really good at living and you're, you're trying to make one dead. Well, sometimes you need a little luck on your side, but that luck sometimes comes by stacking the odds in your favor by doing it more, you know, instead of going in at nine o'clock going, well, we're going to have breakfast. Well, Keep on hunting until noon or one o'clock. You might strike one. And turkeys are the best example of that. You can go, you can go three days and not hear a gobble. And then all of a sudden have the best hunt of your life in five minutes, just because you stuck it out and you called and you covered ground and you finally got one in that right mood. So persistence is one of the best things I could ever offer anybody in terms of advice, how you become better, be persistent, be smart about that persistence. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it, even too, Mark, on that, I, I completely agree. And I think a lot of times people try to make the deer or the turkey the intellectual when, in fact, we're the intellectual. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, it's the same thing. So timing is crucial and persistence is everything. But how you apply that persistence and the timing of it is what's crucial. Um, I would say the juries were the first to ever. You guys did the best job of breaking it down, you know, in the 13 phases, say a whitetail um, and, and saying, OK, there's a time to go hard and there's a time to be conservative. But that that's in life. Right. So so we as an intellectual is, is a higher thinking thinker. We know. I mean, we know. And, and I use a relationship, say, with my wife. I, I know if I've got some heavy stuff I need to put on her or, or talk to her about. The timing's everything. I mean, I, you know, if I wake up and boy, she done missed her coffee and she's mad and the hair won't do right and the young is done messed up the house, like, I ain't bringing this up right now. I'm going to wait. I'm going to maybe wait to a real happy moment. And she's got her favorite place to eat and glass of wine. I'm like, hey, honey, there is something. I know we're having a good time, but I want to break. I want to tell you about, you know. So, okay, that we all know that as men. Women know that about us, you know, men too and they do the same thing so uh, i think the same thing can be applied to wildlife you know people talk about calling too much or calling too aggressive intellectually i'm the intellectual that hears it i'm like man dude i'm gonna pour it on mark start a fire with that box call this joker is coming we cannot make him not unless lightning strikes him on the way and there ain't yeah. no cloud in the sky i mean this joker is hot we intellectually know we read the situation same with these deer you kind of know if it's early season and you know that they're coming out mostly in these food plots in the evening um, and, and only coming out that last 30 minutes for dark, well, you're probably doodling in the wind to, to hunt a lot of mornings. It's not a good, maybe persistent, smart way to be persistent based on what you know. And so, but, you know, getting into the rut and, and maybe you are still, they can make a lot of mistakes. They're going to be running just as hard early morning and looking for love. And so even if you don't have a high end tactical technique to it, you can be persistent and just have a deer, you know, on a cold, clear day with the wind rising, you could bump them out of a food plot walking in that joker might get the right hot dough and run right back under there and, and you get a shot. So I think the same as with Turkey. Um, it's understanding you being intellectual, not, not trying to make it. I think a lot of people want to make them, you want to make them as smart as you. It, that ain't the case. They, they have a very small window of what they're thinking. Um, in my opinion. You're, you're exactly right. And, it, that's what makes it so beautiful to hunt them day in and day yeah. out. The other advice I'd probably give is like when you get on a good streak and they're in the right mood, press the gas, you know, like get after it. When they're in the right mood, there's days you'll go out, boom, 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 you know, roost hunt, nine o'clock, 
1130, three down back at camp for lunch, you know, and then you might go two or three days and not have as much luck. So there's certain things that are happening in their transition, like Harold talked about, and the weather, whatever it might be. But when you're having a good day, press the gas. And when you're having a bad day, you can relax just a little bit because they, they're definitely streaking yes. in the way they'll act. Yes. Holy cow. That, that is a hundred percent fact right there, Mark. I, I always say, you know, when the root's ready to pick, you better pick it because, you know, it ain't going to be good forever. And you're right. You can get in the stage to where you can. And, and, and I know you have stories because I know that you did a lot of entertaining with outdoor writers. I know you obviously did a lot of video work back from Primos to mad to, to all those, you know, Mossy Oak, you look, look at where you've been, you and I have a similar path of, mm -hmm. of having properties, having leases, having opportunities where our partners had leases and we'd come in and you and I'd be kind of part of that scouting crew. And maybe it's, Hey, Mark, Michael, y'all go out there and let's get a good video. And man, me, five or six turkeys gobbling boy we kill it and we got another one coming and we back out like oh man let's let's save that turkey you know we got Aaron Pass coming in we need to get him a turkey for the article or you know for us I remember David Blanton and I was hunting this place in Georgia we killed one right off the roost and turkeys were just gobbling we'd get them coming they'd be cutting the distance and we would leave and we were laughing because Earnhardt was coming in in four days Dale Earnhardt and uh and we were saying, let's just save these. We'll come back over. We'll save these for Earnhardt. And he'll have a good, easy hunt. We come back four days later. And we heard two or three turkeys gobbling. And it was just like them suckers had no interest in anything that we had at a higher level of what we knew about turkey hunting. And Earnhardt even said, God dang, y'all been messing with these turkeys. You know, and I'm thinking, no, we hadn't. He said, yeah, y'all did. Y'all took that comedian in here and killed some turkeys. He thought we didn't brought Jeff Foxworth in there and we didn't. <laughs> run through the place and by the average year average situation you think these turkeys been harassed dude if Earnhardt would have been we could have killed all everyone I believe we could have killed every one of them four turkeys I think we could kill them all that day and so I've learned that yeah I mean you can save a turkey but if you you know it, it, unless you just ain't mad at them if you want to go back to the house and get that youngin or check them out of school you better go do it read the situation and get it when it gets good if you're interested in filling that tag if it doesn't matter and you're like I'm gonna wait till it gets hard you can do that too. Yeah. They'll often make you think that they're call shy or people have been hunting them, but that's just the way turkeys act. I mean, that's just the way they I, I agree. I, I agree. Even a step further, Mark, I think a lot of people sometimes, I think deer hunting, deer hunting to me uh, on average is harder on public ground uh, than private because uh, I think we can get our farms conditioned to a situation. They're still wild deer. They're no more any tame than a deer that lives on public they're not they think they are we've conditioned them you can condition a deer to get used to hearing a polaris come by a creek bottom you can get them used just like every place in the midwest is a condition to tractors to combines they they've heard them since in their mama's womb they they've heard combines um uh, you know here in the south i've now conditioned deer just like texas to spin feeders now Am, am, am I making it easy? Yeah, I'm making it easy. I got enough intelligence to say, I'm going to try to make this easy. That's what I'm fascinated by watching y'all show. Y'all have come up with a situation you can sit in your, your, your muddy shooting houses and, and literally have that situation under control. People don't realize, is it easy to a degree? Maybe it is. I think you would agree. But what was hard, how much work did y'all go through to get that condition set up that way? Master manipulators to make sure you took control over it, not allow the deer to. You have now controlled a wild animal and conditioned them. Hate me for it, but everybody dreams of it. Turkeys, turkeys are, are similar. Um, however, uh, this is my opinion. People don't have to disagree. One thing about opinions, people can, is I got, I, I have mine and people have theirs. A lot of people, for me, when I come hunting turkeys, I just want a goblin turkey. I don't care if it's public, private, what species, because that is the point I'm going to read it. If you get me four goblin turkeys, he's on the public ground. If I got my farm and I got one turkey goblin, like, where are my turkeys? I know they ain't here. And somebody said, dude, there's a WMA down the road. We heard seven yesterday. Let's go. Let's mm -hmm. go. Well, there was a good many hunters there. Yeah, but there's seven goblin turkeys. Hard. I know that creek bottom. Let's go in the morning. I got a WMA. I can find just as much success on that WMA because the turkeys are the same. They're either going to be subordinate. Now, people say call shy. Will they be a little more intelligent? Possibly. But they're vulnerable because it's springtime and they're horny and they're wanting to breed. And so you give me one of those OGs. You, you, you give me... Paul Butsky, you give me Eddie Salter, you give me Mark Jury, and I don't feel like I'm at a disadvantage. 
Now, the only thing that would put me at a disadvantage, if you got some Yahoo coming from the creek bottom that blows them all through as you're going, that's what makes it hard. The turkey itself is no more hard. And and, and look, I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm mad because people say, oh, it's easy, Mark. Y'all kill them in Iowa and y'all's on private ground. To me, it's not necessarily. The situation in, this, in the area and the stage and turkey's on can make them very difficult on private or public. It has nothing to do with the pressure in that circumstance. It's the stage that they're in. Um, and so uh, I think deer are a little more susceptible because they feel the pressure and they, 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 they're not embedded in that same area. They get bumped around and moved around. But that turkey, even if somebody comes in there late evening and bumps them off roofs, he's probably still going to be gobbling, just not where I thought I left him. He's going to give his position up and he's going to let me know if he's subordinate, if he's horny, if he's, if he's fired up, he's going to let me know if he set, sets down and I feel like he's got hands and, you know, and so the earth just don't swallow him up. He's going to be there. So for me, I'm not worried about where I hunt a turkey. I just want a goblin turkey. And then I can read that situation. I feel like I got a good odd of, of chance of success and I can go by the legal regulations to figure out what I got in my tool bag that I can manipulate him or trick him. That's just, that's just the way I go about it. There's also a benefit in having room to maneuver and, and to go. I remember when we grew up turkey hunting, Tad and I, we cut our teeth on public ground, you know, but we yep. liked it because it was an unlimited amount of public ground. There were large tracts of public ground. And if that bird was five ridges over, we could go to him. Well, when you're on private ground, oftentimes there's smaller parcels and you're, you're stopped. And if that bird's not on you, it's tough to bring him to where you're at if he's any distance at all. Whereas mm -hmm. on public ground, you could go to him. So there's advantages and disadvantages to hunting private versus public. And of course he mentioned it on public. You got to be mindful of, of other guys out there that are chasing them as well. Cause that gobble, yeah. it's, it's the greatest attraction in nature. <laughs> yes, <laughs> It's going to, it's going to draw some attention if he's got a loud mouth. There ain't no doubt about that. I love Absolutely. the conversation like the, I love it, but it's also overplayed the public private conversation and not necessarily yeah. with Turkey related with deer related. That conversation has been beat to death. But I think it's interesting to talk about from a turkey perspective because uh, we, we were just at the Indianapolis show a couple weekends ago, and we did a live podcast on stage, and the pressure of public-private got brought up, uh, more so on the deer side of things. And I think it, each requires a certain skill set, same thing with turkeys. But, you know, I guess I never really thought about it more. So you, you think when you think public-private, it's always almost always a deer conversation, right? Like, um, which I think – I, I think I hold a good argument on that and everyone likes to discredit guys like you. They don't hunt public. They've never hunted public. Well, it's like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And I, I, I get a chuckle when I hear people say that about, you know, you guys, some of the, the OGs, especially for me um, in the industry. It's like, you think they never hunted public? You're out of your mind. Exactly. It, it, lots of it. Lots of it for years. One of the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life was on a public piece of ground. And I, I hit him high and lost him. I mean, he was just this mega giant coming through the water. I'd set up on a, a, a cove off of a lake. It was on Rapid, actually, public ground. It's one of the places that a lot of people hunt and film on right now. But I was on this cove, a bunch of sign going around. It was a pinch point there. And this giant comes through at like 1130 in the morning. I was going to sit all day. And I, I hit him bad. And I called old Jeff Probst, one of my good friends. This is back in like 90, 91 and uh called jeffy come and help me track him we didn't find that thing and i never knew what happened to that deer but that was a public ground deer and we killed some good deer on public back then and, and piles of turkeys on public so you know it's they can say what they want to but i've evolved through time you mentioned the box blinds over food plots i mean that's what works for me you know and i don't sit in a lot of tree stands anymore because i'm having good luck doing this so um it you know if, you know if, if they're there and that's that's the tactic that i like to use then you know, that's what I'm going to use, but I don't fault anybody for hunting their way because there's a lot of different ways we can, we can bring fulfillment and joy out of the outdoors back to our mind and in our hearts and whatever, whatever makes you happy, go do it, but don't knock somebody else for the way they want to hunt. You know, that's their decision. That's the beauty of hunting. Like go out there and, and make the most out of your, your, your day and your success, do it your way and have a good time, but don't knock somebody else. I mean, you're just, you're just taking away from your own, your own happiness at that point. Yeah, I think some people got nothing going on, and that's the big problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> they just need a yeah. hobby, or they just don't hunt damn near hard enough as they should because, you know, I hear we do a lot of the consumer shows, and we get face-to-face -face with a lot of people, you know, and talk hunting and turkeys and deer and everything else. And it's funny that you never talk to the guys that want to give you, you, know, you crap on the Internet. They're never at the shows. And, and I just find it so entertaining. It's like, where's all the – they're there. 
they're just not talking to us about it. So it's always, it's always, I find it entertaining. The ones, that, it entertaining the, ones that, too. the ones that are most aggressive, I'll always like, you know, if we have a guy really banging us on our page or something, I'll say, Hey, would you jump on a podcast and visit with me about this? And they not one time has one of them taken me up on that. They just won't go face to face. They're just sitting there, you know, harping on their keyboard. But I always just want to talk about it. I'm like, hey, you got a valid point. Let's let's discuss it. They won't ever take the invitation ever. Oh, no, never, yeah. never. They never no, will. That part of it is frustrating to me. And and um, it, I mean, it, it's just a lot of ignorance. In it. And I and and those type people will never be any type of ambassador they really won't they might can lead a movement of hate but i mean what Not can you be that. talking about that of trying to get something banned or, or, or a situation um i i think that it's i've always said i just think it's very narcissistic um well it's, all- it's, a, it's a character trait because those same guys going back to you know talking about understanding the levels of the game they they've boxed themselves into a way of thinking not only in just perception of you know, hunters that have established their name like you guys, but they've, they're also closed minded to the point where they're not going to learn how to tap into that next level of figuring out a turkey and being malleable in their hunting tactics, or they're going to box themselves into this one way of thinking. And that's probably how the way they approach everything in their career, how they talk to other people, they're limited to their own success. And it's just a character trait I've learned when you talk to people like that. So you just kind of have to like, I don't know. I f- I'm finding it more entertaining as we go and our show grows. It's just like, all right, man, cool. Well, ev- evolution is nothing. You can't stop it. I mean, there, there's not anything from, from any sport, um, from media. I mean, you think about it. We're doing a podcast that has a chance to be seen as much as any program TV show, like in the day, back in the you know late 90s and 2000s that Mark and I were part of back in the TNN days. Uh, where that was really the only place hunting can be seen. I mean, or, or a VHS tape that you bought or maybe you rented at a local gas station. So, uh, you know, or a rental house. So, so evolution, you can hate it. I mean, you can hate it, but it's not going to change. You know, there was a time, Mark and I grew up in era two to where to watch TV, you, you know, you, you stood on one foot and turned an antenna and your mama, and sometimes you go outside and if you was, you know, had enough money, you, you had electric antenna that turned it or most of the time, you know, I'd be the kid in the house. So I'd run, turn the antenna boy. I holler at the window and you turn it and boom. Oh, right there. And then you could watch Dukes of Hazard, you know, and if you was rich, you had a super booster and you could watch TBS and watch Atlanta Braves, even if you was in, you know, freaking middle of nowhere, Iowa. That's why there was America's team. We forget these things. Um, back in the day, if you go listen to Chet Akins and all those guys on a flat top guitar, they played amazing music. Uh, and they were they were innovators. They took an acoustic guitar and did things you couldn't do with it. It didn't stop there. A guy named Eddie Van Halen come along and took a, a Stratocaster and ripped the guts out of it, built, you know, uh, basically humbucking guitar pickups, uh, did all these different effects and started finger tapping and doing stuff that we've never heard anything like. And if you don't believe it, go listen to Eruption right now. Go listen to some of the rhythm and amazing sounds he got out of it. Some people hated that that you're going to evolve. There was a time in turkey hunting, Kurt, and Mark knows this, we had a double read call. Just everybody, that's all you could get out of it. And you had a good Lynch foolproof box call. <laughs> Sounded good. All of a sudden, Paul Butsky, Mark was in on this, um, built this thing called a four read cutter where you built a four read calls. Oh my God, you're putting four reads of latex? Now you're going to get condom rubber? Oh my goodness, the sheer existence of the trojan sleek and you're going to make four reads and then you're going to pull the top and cut a little you out of the top right hand side of that call and all of a sudden you hear yeah yeah dog, dog, dog. and all of a sudden walter paris he's purring on this thing it evolved go listen to the world championship in 1974 you know back when ben lee won it and listen to 2000 you know, was it one or two when Ricky Joe Bishop won it? And and then those years that Walter Parrott won three or four Grand Nationals, and now go listen to Matt Van Sice and Dave Owens. Are they taking advantage of evolution? You damn right. You can order condom latex. You can order anything prophylaxis. You can cut calls, different frames, different sizes, different cuts. There's thousands of different cuts from the 70s when Ben Lee and even Eddie Salter. Eddie Salter won all his world championships on double stack read calls. Mark remembers them, the double stack, tr- three stack. I choked to death trying to, but he got rasped. We got this cutting and this throaty sound that nobody had heard before, and he won. Do I hate Eddie Salter for that? I admire him for it. Same with Will Primos and these guys. So everything evolves. It doesn't mean you got to go back on it. 
but even the great legends that preach these hunting heritage, uh, you know, the Neil Cost and, uh, and these people that we love to hear speech, uh, to hear talk about turkey and heritage, the grassroots of it stays the same, the ambience, but our camouflage, our cause is going to evolve. You don't have to use it. You can go back and put on Carhartt Brown or World War II camo, and you can go back to a wing bone. You can go back to that old, you know, Quaker boy, uh, deadly double or, or, or two read hen or, or the triple read or that Jake special, which at the time was a raspy call in its time or a boss hen magnum. Oh my God. Go try to win a world championship on a boss hen magnum. You couldn't these days. Dick Kirby did. Mark knows he's got to be smiling behind this right now. I'm talking because he knows damn well it's the truth. But you know, me and Mark didn't use a boss hen magnet. We did. I remember getting my first sound and thought I was sounding like Dick. Like, oh, dude, world championship coming. By the time I got there, if you wasn't on a full read call or a ghost cut, son, you nobody want to hear that boss hen magnum at that level. Those judges, now you got more realistic hen sounds. So I think the, 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 the thing stops. Do we get to the point where if you're ever a world champion, you know, you got to call with a wing bone. Is that what we're going to say? And so my point is, you can stop in time if you want to. Time ain't going to stop for you. So if you want to use a tactic, use it. But don't ban. You can't ban evolution. You're not going to be the person that bans evolution. It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep advancing. You know, some people hate Eddie Van Halen for playing that way. Play too loud, and that ain't guitar playing. That is just racket. You know, <laughs> it should sound bluegrassy. But guess what? There were some bluegrass players that got hated on, too. Ricky Skaggs and those guys, because – they took it and they wasn't just strumming malicious chord patterns. So mm -hmm. there's many examples out there. So I'm not going to stop evolution. I hope to be part of it. Hopefully in my time span that I was able to tell somebody, Hey, I know not even Dick Kirby realized this, you know, not even Will Primos realized this. Me and Mark realized this. We saw this. We invented something. We understood a tactic. I think that's, probably a passion right now i think mark and terry have done it in deer they're doing it in turkey and when we talk you want to know what it's talk you grab us a cold beer and that's what we're talking about like you ain't gonna believe what i saw the other day and it's gonna be like i saw a doe come out of creek bottom she licked her butt twice come over there shit by a maple tree all right now here's where it gets crazy all right we observed something and from that mark said and you know what i invented a call that i'm gonna try that next time and it might be a next year he said you know that was that was just happening. It ain't never happened again, and it sucks. It ain't going to work, and I ain't going to tell the public about it. All right, and it might be like, you ain't going to believe what I saw. I remember the first time I used, you know, my hat. Um, it had, had this, similar to this, and I remember uh, it wasn't a, everybody thinking a reaping decoy. It wasn't, it wasn't a reaping decoy. It wasn't even a fan, even though I'd read about the Indians using them. I remember I had a hat on similar to this. It had a little beige, and it was camo, and I remember the sun was shining on me. And I remember this turkey was out in this cow pasture and um, I told David Blunt and I said, I swear to God, I believe the sun's right on me. I believe if I just go, my head's round. And I had, and back then I had that old country boy, you know, that old bush like, you know, where, you, you know, everybody had that there tunnel right there. And yeah. I said, man, I had, look at this. And you can see it kind of looks like a turkey. And if that sun shine on it, maybe I can twist around a little bit. And I had on a beige glove and I was, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was going through and I was twisting my hand. I'd hide. That gobbler saw my hat and come running across the field, not at a fan, at my head. Uh, now, people think I'm crazy, but that happened. And that's when I shot that turkey. My eyes was big and I'm like, oh my God. Now, somebody says, well, you didn't invent it. No, I didn't invent it. It was the first time I experienced it and it changed my game. That's when I'm on the phone with somebody like Mark. That's when I'm on the phone with my buddy Paul Butts. You ain't going to believe what I just did. Have you ever had this experience? I use my hat and the sun and that circuit run at me. And it's somebody like Paul might say, I've never had that happen. Or he might say, well, Michael, I ain't never told nobody, but let me tell you what I did. One time I did this and it worked. Or you talked to Denny Gulbis. I remember talking to Eddie Salter and he told me one time, he said, let me tell you something, boy. He said, decoys ain't legal in Alabama. He said, but you know what is? Drinking a Coca-Cola, red and white can. He said, take a little monofilament. He said, and just I'll put that red can by a tree when you're working a turkey, that white can. I did it. I don't know if it's illegal. Is that a decoy? It ain't illegal to drink a Coca-Cola. That turkey, see that red and white can? Now, not quite like the velocity of coming to the pretty boy. You can't keep a redneck from thinking, man, and you ain't going to stop evolution. So people can hate on it, but you're doing something that you had to put no thought in other than to follow an old school mythology. Nobody stands still. People are singing better. For Christ's sakes, people are beating the freaking records on the world on the 40-yard dash, and we've been doing that since 
since the caveman, since Jesus, you know, or, or God invented me, and I'm convinced Adam and Eve run a 40 yard dash and raced each other, and we still breaking records. So something's happening. So anyway, sorry to get on my vent. I love it. <laughs> you know, Michael, uh, I talked about this book not long ago. It's one that Jim Cassidy wrote called Remembering the Greats. So everyone within the book has all passed. And he took it from back in the 1800s, and I, maybe it was Jordan, I think the guy's last name was Jordan, all the way up to present day, like Dick Kirby's in there and, and Colonel Dave Arbor and all these greats that have passed away. There's like, he highlights and, and does a biography on about 40 or 50 different people. And they're one of, one of those was James McElhaney, all right? Yeah. That was back in the early 1900s. Well, Rob Keck came in and turkey hunted with me last spring, of which he still runs a single recall back to our calling. Crazy good, too. That Crazy devil, is it the devil's tongue, they call it? Is it is, ain't it like a little half recall? He gave he gave me one, and I couldn't run it. I, I ran it okay, but not like Rob, you know. But <laughs> anyway, he had this book by McElhaney. I think it was called The Hunting of the Eastern Wild Turkey or something like that. It was a basic. But I read that whole book, and I was just – fascinated at how much back in the early 1900s they had already talked about his favorite he said my favorite way to eat turkey and he talked about all of them but the best way is fried in a pan with butter you know like and his turkey hunting methods and a lot of what they did back then was all in the fall and they kind of almost shamed those that were hunting them in the spring back then but it, it really did bring it full circle like reading all the stuff like it it's like uh, I see people talking about stuff on social media and I'm like, they were talking about this back in the early 1900s. Like we, we constantly evolve, but we constantly rediscover stuff that's already known, you know, and it, it's a great yeah. book if you've never read it. I don't know if you yeah. have, but once I picked it up, I couldn't put it down. Both Jim Cass's book and that one by McElhaney were just awesome. I like to check that out. I had a similar experience reading, reading some Pope and Young stuff. Um, uh, you know, when they were hunting across Africa and even reading some of Fred Bear's field notes. And um, I was blown away, kind of similar to what you were saying, how raw it was and how unfiltered, you know, to where, you know, basically, you know, Pope and Young are talking about shooting Cape buffaloes. It's like, okay, keep shooting a cup Cape buffalo with this size air isn't going to work. We put seven airs in him and he's just, all he is is hurting. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, we realize that, you know, or Fred Bear taking a shot at a line in India to miss him and ends up hitting him. Uh, you know, or, or like, you know, Fred Bear, uh, fascinating. He killed this huge, I think it was a doll sheep. It was, it was a sheep, you know, a big horn sheep. I forget what species, but he, he, he drew his bow and it was an unbelievable technical shot that he could see the animal's head, but he was, the vitals are hidden. So he lofted, he basically put together in reality, probably a decently, man, it feels weird to say this about somebody, Fred Bear, maybe an unethical shot. Like, I think I can just kind of half cock his bow and just loft it over this hill. Well, that's what he did, and he killed it. And then he basically said that it was something he thought he could do, but it was not high efficiency in what he thought would happen when he did it. And when I read these things, I'm thinking, oh, my God, if they'd had social media then, they would have been crucified. And, uh, yeah. But I like the honesty, and, and and they were evolving. They were seeing what you could get away with and, uh, mm -hmm. and what you could do. And I think that's what we do today. I'm still trying to figure out where can I push the limits. It doesn't mean I'll ever go back to that point again in the limits because I have my own limitations to what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, in Florida, you can still take a high-powered rifle and go shoot, I think, and shoot a turkey with a rifle. You can in Texas. Um, Texas, there, sure. there's, there's some areas it's pretty easy to get uh, depredation permits and go kill deer at night, you know, with thermals and are, um, you know, with high power rifles and rights lights, you know, I, I don't find a lot of joy in that. I'm not, I'm not going to condemn those people who, you know, get an opportunity if they want to go shoot with a rifle. Uh, Hey, the state says you can. So am I going to be the guy that's trying to make it illegal? I'm just not going to be the guy who does it, yeah. but I'm just not a hater, man. And, and I think that's what it gets to. There's a lot of tactics and evolution is real. There's just so many of these things we're talking about that people get misconstrued. And, and um, I think that's, here's, here's what I'll, to end with that. What makes all those guys that Mark and I were talking about unique is the fact that they were all major individual, very bold, loving, charismatic personalities that were individualized. So mm -hmm. think about if these people get their way on the way you should deer hunt, everybody possibly would look exactly the same. Everybody would be in a, you know, in a tree saddle with face paint, you know, or yepping on a wing bone with, with a 20 gauge or a 410. 
uh, you know, dressed in World War II camo and, and going back old school. What was great about these guys we talked about, their personalities were so individualistic. And, and believe me, if you ever, ever had a conversation with Ben Lee Rogers, I mean, that Joker was bigger than life. He was like amazing. And, and, uh, and for me, that's what makes these guys the individual thing that they brought to it. They understood the roots, but they all brought their own vibe. And I think that that's a responsibility. I hope I bring that. Mark certainly does it. Some of these new people, Kurt, y'all do that in your own personality, you know, having a beer and, and, uh, and, and being yourself and your buddies talking and just, just sitting around a campfire. That's what I liked about the realness of it. I love some of what those hunting public guys are doing. They bring a new aspect. The seek one guys think about how, Think, man, those guys had a long line. I was so proud to see that. And it, I felt mm. like this proud dad uh, seeing that. I've never had a chance to kill a big deer in like a subdivision in Atlanta. And, dude, I want to. I yeah. want to. Uh, well, I'm just going to ask I, you guys both because we're getting close. I was going to ask you, but and you're, you've answered it already, but I'm curious, like, what excites you about – the future or like, you know, in the next 20 years, who will be considered the OGs or whatever? Like I was going to ask what excites you guys and you kind of answered it, but cause we're boxed into just a few minutes left. Like if you guys had to like short answer it, what excites each of you the most about the future of hunting or the industry or whatever, however you want to look at it, it doesn't matter. The ability for people to communicate and learn in a very quick fashion through it is the technology age and then be able to take that out in the woods and make themselves better and be better at conservation. That's yeah. the thing that I see amongst a lot of young people. Like they're very worried about keeping them alive. And I yeah. think that's very important right now. So yeah. as you see the evolution, evolution happens quicker because it's all tech technological. It's all being broadcast and it's all a shotgun approach. Michael and I came through a funnel, right? You either had an article published by a, a, a magazine editor or it, you had to go through the Outdoor Channel to get on TV or TNN, whatever whatever it was. Now you got YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook. You can get out there and, and create your own channel. So it's exciting to see the Seek Ones and the hunting publics go out there and do that and get more people into our space. Like as, yeah. if we can grow our numbers, that's exciting. Well, the more mm -hmm. people you touch, the better chance we have of doing that. For sure. I agree with that too, uh, Kurt. Uh, Mark answered it great. Uh, is is I think you know just to add to that the individualistic. It, it's kind of like music. It's kind of like when you know Tyler Childers come on country music. You know certainly um, he brought a spark. Like whoa, what is this? That's mm -hmm. that. But guess what it was? It had a lot of tradition in it, but he brought it back. And so I think the, the individual, you know, you look at artists, you look at comedians, you know, like uh, excited to say, man, next week I'm taking Theo Vaughn and Caleb Presley. We talked oh, about. Are. Make sure to send you some pictures and stuff. Yeah. Uh, just recently talking to actually today, I was talking to him earlier about it. And on top of that, now now Jim Brewer's coming, the other comedian. So I can't oh, imagine. No, I'm probably gonna, I figure it's going to be a diet plan. I lose ten pounds laughing down there. But um, <laughs> you know that they've never hunted, never shot, never done anything. But for me, you know, when I look at them, they're such individuals, and they such brought a different vibe to it like theo vaughn i heard joe rogan talk about the way he says things and cuts jokes he's just special mm -hmm. uh, you know the way I look at those og turkey hunters they were special to me and how individual they were how yet they all fit say the same passion so i that's it i think pushing the envelope I'm, I'm man hats off to you guys hats off to so so yes you guys are already there it's it's in the light of working class bow hunter podcast it's in the light of seek one and those guys pushing the envelope said hey we're not gonna worry about it we're gonna go we're gonna go kill a big 190 inch deer in nelly's backyard and you just <laughs> gonna get over yourself it was on five acres and we're yeah. gonna do it and you're gonna love it and you know hunting public's like dude we're not gonna we're gonna do a 30 minute episode we might not kill a deer and we're gonna have fun and have charismatic personalities and they did it so you forget they're even hunting public you just want to be part of this gypsy spirit Mm -hmm. That is amazing. So it's there, Kurt. The OGs are already starting. Um, you look at Hannah Barron, what she's doing. Everybody wants to say, this girl ain't that country. No, nah, she's country. I mean, I do. I can still ship my squirrels that I kill and ship them to her and her and her daddy would eat them. I mean, she's young, but ambassadors, individual characteristics mm -hmm. that are not common. So I think all that, and last but not least, what I will say, and I agree with Mark, what I do like about even the people that sometimes – hate on us as turkey killers not just ogs but i'm not as mad at the turkeys i used to be i do like even amongst the critics there is an element that's hot and trendy right now about conservation and saving things and not killing things and i hope that's sincere 
I hope it ain't in a way. And sometimes I think what's happening, Kirk, they are sincere, but they're only sincere because if we don't activate and get more hunters in, there'll be more pe- more for me. So I think it's a little selfish content, some of it, but I do yeah. like a lot of the youth is very engaged in conservation and leaving like things. 20 split if I had to throw something. I think it's 80-20. Right There's 20% of them that really don't care about the turkey. They just care that you ain't there on that public ground the morning they hunt because they that that's what makes it easy on them. It's like, wait a minute, 10 turkeys gobbling. Nobody else is here because now nobody else can hunt. We made it illegal. Nobody else can hunt but us. So wish Mark and whatever was shut up trying to get Theo involved and Joe Rogan when they talk about it on a podcast. That's what I want to do. I want yeah. to share it. That's fine with me if it's tougher. Game of fish, you care, decide how much we can kill. There might be one less for me. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That's completely fine. If somebody else can get a chance to enjoy it. That's that's my opinion. Yeah, I think so. But this has been a childhood dream of mine to talk to both of you guys. You know, of course, I didn't know a lot of podcasts back in the day, but I do appreciate both of you guys uh, giving me a chance in this game and making me feel a part of the OGs, just this little blip that I can. And I'm forever grateful for you two in this game because huge inspiration for me and the reason why I'm doing working class bow hunter. So thanks to both of you guys, big time. You're the best brother. Thank you for having us. And Michael, thank you. Your biggest fan right here, buddy. have been since I first met you. I've, I love Michael like a brother since we first met and we've got a great relationship and I know that's going to continue for a long time. Keep on doing what you're doing, buddy. You're the best out there as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, man. That means a lot, Mark, and and so much love to you guys and that Drew team. And you're exactly right. There is no faking, you know, our love for each other, man. We wear different camouflage, shoot different bows, but I'm telling you, there's a hell of a lot of respect that I have. My whole team, man. I mean, we we admire you guys and Kurt. There's no BS, and I know I can speak for Mark on this and what we say about you. Really, I'm telling you, I remember the first time I heard your podcast, I was like, oh my god. These guys are killing it. I love the honesty and the rawness and the individuality of it. And y'all didn't seem to to really care about any judgment. And I think that's what it takes. That's what every trendsetter has always had. Mark and Terry are doing it. I feel like we're doing it at Bone Collector. All these people we talked about that were OG status, they did it. And so mm-hmm. now you're doing it. We Thank named you, some other people that we think are. And so I, I mean it. And uh, same here, man. Love you guys. I mean it. Appreciate it. a lot. Awesome. Thanks everyone for tuning in, watching and listening. Hope you enjoyed this one. We'll see you next week. Peace.